so I encourage you to take your Bibles this morning, and while you're turning there to Psalm chapter 27, going into the Old Testament, Psalm chapter 27, if you would, please, as we take a look into God's Word this morning, let me welcome all of you that are watching us live by way of Rumble and Facebook. Again, God bless you. Thanks for tuning in with this morning with us. We're glad you have chosen to allow us to come into your home or car, no matter camper, wherever you are. Uh, through your tablet, phone, phones, iPads, computers. Thank you so much for tuning in with us. Uh, you've been a great audience. We love your responses, and thanks for being with us today. God bless you. Uh, we're going to look at something very, I think, encouraging that can help us uh, in the days ahead in the crisis that we find ourselves in. As we turn to the book of the Psalms, chapter 27, David, of course, is the writer of this psalm, and David is writing of the fact because David is involved in a crisis, not only in his life, but in the kingdom. And we're not sure whether or not if this is a national crisis or that it's a kingdom crisis or that it's a crisis. And no doubt, I think from the text as you go through it, you can see that he's facing a national crisis because he mentions several words in there, and you'll see that. Oh, and also a personal crisis as you read what he says referring to himself. And so there's no doubt that all of us experience crises in our lives. And we're going to go through them. Uh, our world is going through a crisis right now. Has been for the past several years of crisis. And we've all wondered what to do of the uncertainty of the times in which we're living. The uncertainty of the future. You know, we're, we're, we, don't know who hold, we don't know what holds tomorrow, but I know who holds my hand. Amen? And uh, I can't see any further than today, but God can see way beyond that. And I cannot predict or see the future, but God can see the future. And so, but we, we face these crises as we go through them. And we're going to take a look at this in the, uh, in the Psalms here. But let's uh, just as a quick kind of a review here, a little bit of an intro, and then we're going to read the scripture. But I want you to notice that crisis brings anxiety due to uncertainty about the future. Amen. And the bigger the crisis, the bigger the anxiety. I mean, it really is. The bigger the crisis that you and I go through and our country goes through, the bigger the anxiety, the worry, and of course, what brings that is fear. Then the bigger, the greater the fear is, and David mentions that in this psalm, and we're going to take a look at it here a little bit, but you know, everybody uh, hopes for the future and, and has hopefully some kind of plans for the future and accordingly, and we've all done that, amen, but even though we can't see beyond this life, we have the promise of God for the future beyond this life. God has a promise for our future beyond this life. And this life is going to be full of trials and circumstances and situations and crises. And some of them are heavy, some of them are light. But nevertheless, they're still going to come. The world is in a crisis right now. I mean, who's going to predict the future of, uh, of Ukraine and Russia? What's going to take place there? And they're still fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq. And they're still fighting in Somalia. And, I mean, they're fighting all over the, the world. I mean, there's a crisis. And, and people are facing a crisis. The, the United States is facing a crisis. We don't know what the future holds for tomorrow. The uncertainty of it. I mean, think about it for a minute. And so there's no doubt that in this passage, David has concerns for the future. He's, he's the king of Israel, you know, so certainly the king's going to have some, future, uh, some worry and concerns about the future of the nation of Israel. There's no doubt about it. But also in the psalm, we notice that uh, he has some concerns about himself. And all through David's kingdom, uh, there was war after war after war. And sometimes it was internationally, sometimes nationally, sometimes within the kingdom itself. You remember a Saul tried to kill him. You remember Absalom, his own son, started a revolt against the kingdom against him. The Philistines were after him. Uh, Goliath insulted him. I mean, it's just, just constantly uh, uh, the troubles that David went through. You remember David's sin and all the crisis that involved in that sin around Bathsheba and everything. I mean, this guy, this guy knows about crisis. And, and in here, it's interesting, he, in this prayer, really, of David's, he's not asking the Lord to remove the crisis. Here's where we need to learn today, okay? He's asking the Lord to use the crisis in his life. See, we're all so quick to want to get out of it and to be delivered and get us through it, but yet God wants to use it in our lives. 
And there's several reasons why he wants to use it. And if you'll see that and look at it in this light, uh, you're going to be a whole lot happier. You're going to say, hey, man, let's just keep it coming. You know, and enjoy the journey, enjoy the ride, uh, because God has a great plan for it. Now, no one, of course, likes crisis. They're uncomfortable. They're unpleasant. Uh, you know, we always wonder, when are we going to get out of this? How long is it going to last? Well, uh, David's got some answers for us. He's got five steps in this passage I found. Five steps that will help us to deal with the crisis in our lives, the crisis in our town, the crisis in our country, the crisis in our state, the crisis in your marriage, the crisis in your relationships, the crisis in your business. I mean, you know, we all go through crisis. And so where do we turn? Man doesn't have the answer, church. God has the answer. And we turn to God's word to get the answer. So that's what we're going to do today. David was concerned about people trying to kill him. That I just, maybe somebody trying to kill you. May not be physically, but it could be with words. Okay? Maybe uh, David was concerned about uh, those that he trusted had forsaken him. You ever been there? Yeah. He's concerned about it. It's a crisis. You know, it's a crisis when there's people you trust and depend on and then they forsake you. It's a crisis in your life. David was concerned also a little bit in this psalm. We find he's wondering with all this going on, he was, he was concerned whether God was going to see him when he called on him. And I know some of you have thought that same thing as well. So we're going to see how David can help us out in this. So David shows us five wonderful steps in this passage uh, that's going to help us uh, to concern and deal with, the, with the, the crisis of life. So let's read it together. Let's start here in Psalm chapter 27, beginning in verse number 1. Uh, follow along with me. What encouragement right off the bat, okay? You're in a crisis, all right? How many are in a crisis here today? If you're not in one today, you may be in one tomorrow. Then mark it down. They will come. I guarantee you they will come. Uh, just trust me, they'll come. But notice what he says right in the middle of, now matter of fact, in David's writing this, he's in the middle of a war. You know, and David was a man of war. His whole kingdom, his whole reign was de- a, re- a realm that he dealt around, and his reign, his king, was, a, it was constantly fighting a- and wars. And that's why, you see, David couldn't build the temple. His son had to build it. And was it wasn't because of David's sin of Bathsheba of adultery and lying and murder. No, the Bible said, God said, David, I'm not going to let you build a temple because you were a man of war. You were a man of bloody hands. So if anybody, so if, 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 if war does bring crisis, really does. So he's writing this, think about this with me. He's in the middle of a war. Saul tried to kill him. The Philistines tried to kill him. His son Absalom leads a revolt against him. All this is going on. So he comes in, he says, the Lord is my light. (laughs) What encouragement right there. Is God your light today in the midst of your crisis? He's not only my light, he's my salvation. Now the word salvation there is not talking about being saved. It's talking about deliverance. He's my deliverer. Listen to David open up this psalm. It's just so beautiful. Whom shall I fear? Church, who in the world can you fear today if God is your light and he's your deliverer? You need not to fear anything. But yet we do, don't we? And the darker the hour gets, the greater the fear. See, how many of you were feared when you were kids when it was dark? How many of you still fear when it's dark? All right, all right praise the Lord, amen, all right. Look at this. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Listen to him talk about this, but then you're going to see it changes here in a little bit. Of whom shall I be afraid? Verse 2. Now, notice how we're talking about here the wicked and the oppressor and all of this. The wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh. Trying to kill him. They stumbled and fell. Uh, What confidence. What confidence. Though an host should encamp against me. See, now he's talking about being surrounded by the enemy. My heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Some of these key words is what we're going to pick out and look at, okay, in just a minute. One thing I have designed. Now watch this. This is a guy that's in a national crisis. He's in the middle of a war, and he says, there's one thing I desired of the Lord. What are you desiring in your crisis this morning? You see. That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. 
to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy upon, uh, also upon me and answer me. Wow, what a prayer. In the middle of a crisis. You notice he's not even focused on the crisis so much as he is on with his relationship with the Lord. When thou sayest, seek ye my face, and this is what David says, when, when you tell me to seek your face, my heart said unto me, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither for forsake me. Jesus promised I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. Hallelujah. We have that promise from God. Neither forsake me. O God of my salvation, when my father and my mother forsook me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Lead me in the plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses have arisen up against me. I can relate with David in most of this psalm. And such as breathe out purity, I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. What a psalm. We're going to try to pick it apart a little bit and try to help us out with it. So let's pray, okay? Our Father, how we do thank you. We praise you this morning. God, we ask you to bless our time in the Word now. We thank you for the introduction we've had. We have a, a kind of a good background of what's going on here, what's happening in the life of David. And, and so, Lord, we pray that you'll be able to use it to be a blessing to us, to be a blessing to those that hear it, to be a help, to be an encouragement. And, of course, by all means, if there's anyone here today in the auditorium, those that are listening on the radio, the Internet, the YouTube, the iPads, the phones, the tablets, the television, uh, Father, we pray that they would come to know Christ, that they would come to know the Lord Jesus, whom to know is life everlasting, that they would be saved and be born again and, and let Jesus be their deliverer. And so, Father, we just want to thank you and praise you this morning. Thank you for the good group, for the good singing. Thank you for our friends, Lord. We just want to give you praise and glory. Now, precious Holy Spirit of God, be our teacher and our guide as you will guide us into all truth. We ask you to give us illumination, understanding of the scriptures. Give us wisdom to apply the scriptures. That's what we gain understanding of today. And by all means, we ask that you would help your servant today. Father, we pray that you'd bring to remembrance the things that Jesus has said to us. We ask that you would anoint your servant in this hour that we could have your power and your anointing to stand in this place and proclaim the truth of the word of God. And so, Lord, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory for it, and we'll pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. So let's begin to try to look at some of the five steps that our brother David here shares with us. And we find the first one here in verses 2 and 3. I want you to take a look at the step of vigilance. The step of vigilance. The word vigilance there means to be, uh, it's the quality or state of being vigilant. It means being alert. It means being watchful. It means to avoid danger. Now you can imagine with that going on in David's life, you know, he, he needed to become, and you and I need to be aware of our circumstances. We need to be aware and alert of the, of the, of the, the circumstances, the situation, the crisis that we're in. You don't want to go into it with a blind eye and, and, and without any reason. You need to be aware of it. You need to be aware of the danger that there is bad people out there. You need to be aware of the danger that we live in a bad world. Okay, that this world is a bad world. The Bible says that it's getting worse and worse every day. That the love of many shall wax cold. See, it's not going to get better, folks. It's going to get worse. See, it's got to get worse so that the Antichrist can be revealed and it's also that Jesus can come in the clouds of glory for his church. Amen? And so we need to be aware of these things. You need to have an understanding that the bad news, and we've heard a lot of bad news in the last few years, amen? 
and we still are. And don't be looking to the news and the media for good news because basically you're just going to get bad news and, and lies and propaganda and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so the bad news David learned in this is that the world uh, that David lives in is, hey, man, this is, this is bad. We're, we're living in a bad world. The Bible says that our heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And, and so we have the, the bad news is that the world that we live in, David was aware of his situation, that the fact that he had enemies. How many of you believe we're living in a fallen world? See, we've been living in a fallen world since the Garden of Eden. See, when Adam sinned in the garden and fell, the world fell. And we came under the death sentence, the death penalty of sin. You see, so that's bad news. You see, that's the bad news, that the world is, is under the, the death penalty because of the fallen world of Adam and sin. And so David was aware of this situation because he'd already facing Goliath and the Philistines and everybody else that's going on and Saul and his own son trying to kill him and raise a revolt in his own kingdom, his own family against him. Hey, folks, we're living in a bad world. And you need to be aware of that. And you need to be aware that there are bad people out there. And, 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 and there's bad things that are happening. Uh, David was alert to his surroundings. Remember, he mentioned that they were encamped all around me. See, the, the, the devil has his demons and his uh, uh, agents that are surrounding us. And, and we need to be aware of that. That's why Paul said, put on the whole armor of God, because we're in a warfare. See, David was in a physical war, but he was also in a spiritual war. And we're in a spiritual battle every day of our lives. Every day you got to get up and get dressed in the armor of God and go out and face the enemy of the world, which is the devil and his demons. And the book of Ephesians tells us that. No, you need to be conscious of that. You need to be aware of that. Uh, you, need, you need to be aware of your surroundings. You need to be aware of the situation that you're in. David was aware that, aware that his enemies were nearby, and they were out to destroy him. And I want to tell you something. The enemies are nearby, and they're out to destroy you. Especially as a preacher of the gospel, the enemies are nearby. They're out to destroy the preacher of the gospel. They're out to just shut him down. They're out to stop the gospel being preached. They're doing everything they can do to shut the church down and to shut the ministry down and the television and the radio and the internet. Two weeks in a row now, our, television, our radio ministry hasn't gone off, quote, to some computer problem. Well, who causes computer problems? It's the devil. You know why? Because the message that was playing was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when 65% of Americans don't believe in the resurrection, no wonder the devil doesn't want it on the radio. We're in a battle. We're in a battle. Oh, man, the, 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 David knew that, that, that the world was evil, and it's evil because of sin. That's the big problem. It's the curse of sin. That's why the world is in the shape that it's in. That's why all that's going on is because of sin. David had a consciousness of an awareness of that and all that he was involved in, and so that's the bad news. You see, the Bible says that the, for, by one man's sin, that was Adam, right? So death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. See, there, there's the problem. That's the bad news. But David also knew, hey, you know what? It's one thing to get bad news, but what happens when you get worse news? Then there's the worst news. And David, the worst news was that David realized the spiritual condition of mankind. See, that's the worst news today is the spiritual condition of mankind. David noticed that the sin in the hearts of all men, that their hearts were motivated by evil intentions. And that's what we got today. You see, the Bible says, my heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? See, and, and, and so we have this presence of evil out here. We have this presence of, of the evil condition of all men because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world was Adam and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for all, that all have sinned. You see, and, and that's, uh, that sin separates them from God for all eternity. See, that's, it's bad news to one thing to know that the world we're living in is bad. The worst news is to know that men are lost without Christ, and without Christ they'll spend an eternity in a place called hell. Amen. You see, you, you're not going to stop the word of God. But see, the enemies are all around us out there. 
And they're wanting to stop the Word of God. They want to stop the message of the Word of God because man is in himself is evil. He's born with a sinful nature. He's born into sin. Sin. He was conceived in sin. He practices sin. He chooses to have sin. So therefore, we have a real crisis on our hand in the world, and it's a crisis of sin that separates man and woman and boy and girl from the eternal God because of sin. That's the worst news that anybody can hear. So we have the bad news, we have the worst news, and, and David acknowledged that about even himself. David acknowledged, he says, I'm a carrier of this problem because I too have a sin problem. Amen? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? Everybody, we've all sinned. So see, David includes himself in that. You see, that's why listen to what Isaiah 64, 6 says here. But we are all as unclean and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. That filthy rags they're referring to was the wet rag pus rasses around leprosy that had wet leprosy. And they wrapped themselves in these rags and then they were all wet and gooey with, uh, with leprosy. That's what Isaiah is referring to here. That our righteousness as his leprosy rags, wet, uh, wet leprosy. And we all do a fade as the leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. That's what the Word of God says. So we see the bad news. We have the worst news. Ah, but you know what? It'd be once in a while be great if NBC and ABC and CBS and them would give us some good news. I've got some good news for you today. In light of the bad news and the worst news, I've got some good news. You want to know what it is? It's a cure. We have the cure for the spiritual condition of man. God sent his son to die for your sin and my sin. That's the good news. That's the gospel, the death and burial resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, this is the cure. This is the answer for the bad news. This is the cure and the answer for the worst news, you see, because we've got the cure. And the cure is the gospel. That's why God said, listen to me, world, humanity, in spite of it being a bad and wicked and evil world, in spite of your sin condition, I can take care of it for you. Because you see, church, you and I can't do nothing about our sin. I can't eradicate it. I can't erase it. I can't get rid of it. There's only one person who can, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the only one person that can forgive us of our sin, who can cleanse us from all of our sin, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ and his atoning death on the cross of Calvary. That is the cure. You see, and God loves you and I so much that did what? For God so loved the, say it with me, loud. For God so loved the, keep going, begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in me should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the good news. That's the cure. But hey, I got something better than that even. You say something better than that? Yeah, there's bad news, there's worse news, there's good news, and there's the best news. The best news. The cure, here it is, is provided as a free gift. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. It's absolutely free. This is the best news. The fact that God, you say, okay, I understand, there's the cure God loves me, but wait a minute, I got the best news. God provided the cure. Amen. Oh, he provided it as a free gift to you and I. Romans 10, 9 says this, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. How many of you believe that this morning? You see, that's the best news. See, you couldn't provide salvation for you. I couldn't provide salvation for you. None of us could. So God says, there's bad news. The world's evil. It's all around us. Okay? There's worse news because man's spiritual condition. He's lost without Christ because of sin. Well, I've got some good news. I sent my son to take care of that problem. And the best news is it won't cost you anything, but it cost me in heaven everything. You have to confess and believe. And the Bible says, thou shalt be saved. See, there's the best news. So God provided as a free gift, and the cure comes with power. All right, but I'm going to move on here. Step number one, then, the step of vigilance. 
Step, be alert. Be watchful. Uh, avoid danger. Look out for it. In a time of crisis, it's there. It's all around you. All right, but the second is, I want you to see in the psalm here, is in verses 1 and 3. And that is the step of confidence. The step of confidence. Are you with me? Say amen. All right, let's take a look at this step of confidence, first of all. I want you to know David, David had fear, did he not? He talked about it. But he also had confidence at the same time that God controlled even the smallest circumstances in his life during the battle with his army. Now look at this confidence that David had. Verse 1, the first thing right off the bat. What is it? What's the first one? How can I have confidence today in my circumstances? How can I have confidence in the crisis, church, that I'm going through? In my home, my marriage, my business, my life, my church. You know, and, and, you know how can I have confidence even though I'm in a crisis? I'm in the middle of one. I just started one. I just ended one. Well, praise God. Get ready for the next one. How can I? Here it is. I can have confidence that God is my light. Is he your light today? David mentioned fear, you see, because God is light. And in him there is no darkness. Amen. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. I've come into the world, into the light, and the world comprehended it not because the, lo the world loves darkness rather than light. And how, have you ever noticed that when it gets dark, you get fearful? Things sound different. They sound strange. You don't know where they come from. You're wondering. You're looking around. And the darker it gets, the greater the fear, the greater the anxiety, the greater the worry. You know, you lay in bed and, uh, you know, you hear something. That happened yesterday morning. Oh, my goodness. I'm laying there trying to think, all right, what's going on? Somebody trying to break in a house or what? You know, you have to be careful in my neighborhood. You got to be aware of your surroundings and situation and your circumstances. You know, I, I live in the hood. And so you got to be careful, KP, in the hood. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, I, I'm reaching. I'm telling you what I'm reaching for. Just don't break in my house. Amen? Amen. Okay, this morning somebody rubbed my, own, my arm. Now, what is going on here, man? The other night somebody was talking. And, you know, this is in the middle of the night. And, and you know, fear gets into your heart. And the other night, my dog out of the middle of the night just, rah, 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 just went ballistic. Jumped, out, jumped up. Carol says, go check it out. I said, oh, you go check it out, man. I'm, I'm staying under the covers. You kidding me? Well, you got the, I said, don't matter. You know how, so go, go take it out. I pulled the covers over. I'm staying in the covers. Oh, he was going ballistic over two cats sitting in my driveway talking to each other. They were communicating. One was laying down like this, you know, little head up. The other one was sitting up, and they were doing their thing, whatever they talk about. And he went ballistic. But, you know, when stuff like that happens, all of a sudden, fear grips your heart. And fortunately, we have some lights on around the house, little lights here and there, so to keep Carol from stumbling so she don't fall and break her nose again. Amen. And, uh, and so that she can get up and take care of it. See, that's why I want light in there, so she can go take care of it. I'm staying, you know, hey, I'm not stupid, man. I'm staying in the bed. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, aren't you glad that the Lord is your light? He's the light that shines in darkness. And the greater the darkness, the greater the fear, the greater the anxiety. So you can be as David in the midst of your circumstance, in the midst of your darkness, in your dark time, and the dark trial that you're going through, and the uncertainty of tomorrow or the next day. You need to do what David said. The Lord is my light. And the light is greater than the darkness, according to the scriptures. Notice what else he said. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my strength. The Lord's going to strengthen you during this time. And we'll notice what else he said. And he's my salvation. That's my deliverer. See, David, in the midst of his crisis, which he had plenty of them, he says, listen, man, I don't know. They're trying to kill me. They got me surrounded. They're after me. No, all this is going on. The, the kingdom is a revolt against me, everything. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my confidence in the Lord. 
Not in man, not in the government. Come on, talk to me. But I'm going to put my confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because church, he is my light. He is my high tower. He is my shield. He is my buckler. He is my savior. He is my God. He is my king. I'm going to put my trust in the light. And he's my deliverer. David was confident that God was going to deliver him. Now, church, you need to have some confidence this morning. And those of you that are watching that are with us this morning, i got to move because time's running out. Uh, You've got to have confidence that God is going to deliver you. Even in the midst of all this. Paul had that confidence. Paul had this confidence that nothing, that whatever happened to him, he would benefit from it. How many of you remember what all what Paul went through? But did he benefit from it? Yes, because he said, what did Paul say when he sums all that up? If God be for us, then who can be against us? Is God for us today? Yes. Yes, is God for you today? Yes. Now, they may come against you, but you got the victory. You've won the battle. Well, there'll be some circumstances, and they may be uncomfortable, and they are usually. But hey, well, 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and 8. Therefore, we are always, Paul said, confident Knowing, what confidence? See, confidence is knowing something. What do we know? Know that with, while we are at home in the body, that is his flesh, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith. See, God wants us to walk by faith, church, not by sight. And if you get, stay focused on the circumstance, then you're living and walking by sight rather than living and walking by faith. Okay, we're walking by faith. We are confident, Paul says, I say, and willing rather to be absent from this body, the flesh, and to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. Therefore, Paul says, I take pleasure in infirmities, okay, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, the only way you're going to be strong is you've got to become weak. And the only way you're weak is you've got to take, uh, you got to take what Paul says here, you have to take ple- oh, pleasure. Come on, Paul, are you all right? You have to take pleasure in your circumstances. You have to take pleasure in your crisis. And both of us, oh no, I want out of this as soon as I can. So we see the second step is first we need to be vigilant. We need to be aware. We need to be alert. We need to be watchful, on guard. Second, we need to have confidence. Confidence in the Lord. Thirdly, a step of reverence. David had a step of reverence. This is going to help you get through the crisis. See, I find that sometimes when people get into crisis, they forget the Lord. I find when people go get into crisis that we don't see them any longer. You see, and instead they go further away from the Lord rather than coming to the Lord. Why do you think you're going through the crisis? See, if God is sovereign, and he is, can I get an amen on that? That means that God is in charge. God makes the rules. He rules and runs the universe. Nobody else does but him. He's still on the throne. Nobody's dethroned him. We don't have to vote every four years on him. Hello, we don't have to whether we're right or left or whether we start with an R or we start with a D or we're a green or this or that. I don't know what, you know, no. There's none of that goes on. God is God and God will always be God and God is where he is and where he will always be. Amen. And that's the throne in glory. Hallelujah. How do I know the reverence? The step of reverence begins in verse four. One thing I have desired of the Lord. Now, David's in the middle of a crisis, and rather than asking God to deliver him from the crisis, you see, or to remove the crisis from him, David says, I've got but one desire, and that's to seek after the Lord. Let me ask you, are you seeking after the Lord in your crisis today? See, that's what David was doing. He was seeking after the Lord. And you know what he was doing in this thing of reverence? And it comes from the verse there in verse 5. He says, he inquired in his temple. Then you go down to verse 6, and he made offerings and sacrifices of joy in the temple. Because you've got to remember, church, in the Old Testament, that to get to the presence of the Lord. See, the step of reverence is going to lead you and I into the presence of the Lord. And David desired to be in the presence of the Lord. And in order for David to be in the presence of the Lord in the Old Testament, you understand, he had to go to the temple. 
Because in the Old Testament, God resided in the temple or the synagogue. And he said, that's where I'll take up my place. That's where I will be. That's where you will come. That's where you do this and do that. Everything was in the Old Testament was in the temple. So David, in the midst of his crisis, in the midst of a war, a KP, he desired to go to the temple. By the way, this is the modern day temple. This is the church of the living God. And where two or more are gathered in his presence, I'm in the midst of them. I'm in the middle. Hallelujah. And today I don't have to, I have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of me, dwelling in me. I have the presence of God in me, you see. And so we have that reverence uh, to be in the very presence of God in the midst of our crisis. The presence of the Lord, the greater the crisis. God uses, now listen to me, here's where it gets, the rubber meets the road now. God uses the crisis to draw you and I closer to him. He uses the crisis in our lives to bring us and to draw us into his presence. Are, are you with me? That's what David is saying here. That's what he's talking about. Okay, he says that in verse 4 through 7. You've got to read the whole thing there. We already read it, but for time's sake, I'm not going to read it again. But he wants to be drawn into the presence of the Lord. This was the one thing David desired from the Lord. In the midst of his crisis, he says, I want to live in your presence. And in order for David to do that in the Old Testament, he had to go to the temple. We're in the New Testament. We got the Holy Spirit of God living in us. Church, we can go to his presence anytime we want to. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, we can come into the presence of God, yes, in the middle of your crisis. Amen. But it's a choice you have to make. Oh, in your times of crisis, two things can happen. In your time of crisis this morning, church, two things can happen. God can remove the crisis or God can use the crisis. Choice is yours. What do most of us do? God, get me out of this. I can't take no more of this. How much more can I handle? I can't bear any more. Well, the Bible says God knows what you can bear, and he won't put any more on you than what you can. So whatever you're going through, you see, then that means God knows you can bear it because he hasn't removed it. But see, in David's life, he didn't ask for God to remove it. He asked God to use it. See, the crisis you and I are going through and what we experience is God wants to use it to draw us closer to him, number one, you see. And in and, and, and Philippians 1.12, Paul said, but I would ye should understand, brethren, I want you to understand something. The things which happened unto me, Paul saying the things that happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Paul spent most of his life in prison for the furtherance of the gospel. Paul said, listen, if the crisis that I'm going through, the thorn in my flesh that I'm experiencing, all the battles that I'm tracing and so forth, if that is going to be for the furtherance of the gospel, hallelujah. God brings crisis into our life for the furtherance of the gospel. That's why when the crisis come, how are you going to handle it? What's going to be your attitude? What's going to be your outlook? Are you going to praise God? You're going to give him the glory? You're going to give him praise? You're going to be a testimony to those around you? Because see, that's what's going to further the gospel. But if all you're doing is moaning, complaining, and crying, and whining, and fussing, that's not going to bring God any glory. That doesn't bring God pleasure. It's up to you and I on how we deal with it. And see, when we have this, when we're in the presence of the Lord and God's using this crisis, he wants us to have a better perspective of the Lord. And see, that's where we fail. We, we fail to see the perspective of the Lord uh, when we're in the middle of the crisis. So where do I find that? Well, I'm glad you asked in verse five. Okay, look at me in verse five. Everybody in verse number five? Back up to verse four. We're in five and six, but we're gonna go back to verse four. Look at the last phrase in verse four. David says, when I come into the house of the Lord, I desire to be there to behold the beauty of the Lord. You see, some of us fail to have a perspective of God in the midst of the crisis. We're so focused on the crisis. We're so focused on the trial, the testing, the tribulation, the situation, the circumstances, is that we fail to behold the beauty of the Lord. David says, God's using this crisis, this war in my kingdom, in my life to bring me, draw me closer to him. So I'm going to the temple where he's at and have a good time with him. And he's also wanting me to have a better perspective on him because David has been focusing on the enemy and the war and the battle, which is what it does. And that's what your crisis does. You get so focused with it, you get overwhelmed by it and it overwhelms you and overtakes you. 
And this crisis, in other words, God wants this crisis in your life for you to behold the beauty of the Lord. When's the last time? Listen to me now. I don't care if we run out of time or not. That's the TV time. I got a good editor. We got to get a hold of this thing. When the crisis come, when's the last time you've gone outside and looked up at the sun this morning or the sunrise? When's the last time this evening and you see the beautiful orange sunset? That's the beauty of the Lord. He's the creator God. When's the last time you went out and looked at the stars and got out from the lights and looked at all the stars and you can see the Big Dipper and you can see the Little Dipper and you can see Uriah's belt and all of that stuff, Uriah's belt, and if you got the thing with you, you can pick it all out. And when have you gone outside to behold the beauty of the Lord, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the lakes, and the rivers, and the flowers, and the birds singing, and all that is all the beauty of the Creator God. And God wants you and I in the midst of our crisis, church, to focus on His beauty beauty and it'll give you a better perspective of the Lord see God is the creator did you know he creates the crisis too because he's the creator of all things all things are in his hands all things are in his control nothing can happen unless it goes through and sifted through the, the will of God so you see you need to get a better perspective David wanted God's will in his life and he knew God had used past crisis to shape him into the person he was now. Okay? David completely trusted that God would continue that process. And that's what Paul talked about that we would be in Romans, that we'd be more conformed to the image of his dear son. Christ, God brings crisis and circumstances and so forth to conform us more to the image of Christ. That we might be conformed more like Christ in our lives. So David's given us some wonderful steps here on the king of Israel that could ask God to take it and remove it. But instead he turned it around and he said, God, use it for your glory. Use it for the furtherance of the gospel. I know some folks are sick right now, really sick, really struggling. Let me encourage you if you're watching this today. We love you. We're praying for you. And we're going to pray for you in just a few minutes from now. But oh, my dear friend, take and use what you're going through for the glory of God. Use it to, to witness, to be a testimony, to give God the praise and the glory, and I know it's hurtful, I know it's painful, I know you're struggling, I know you wish things were this or that, but that's all right. Uh, give it to God, let God have it and take it and use it for the furtherance of the gospel to all of those doctors and nurses and techs and aides and, 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 and custodial staff and everybody that will come into your life and family uh, to the glory of God of what you're going through for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, one day, it'll all be over. Glory awaits you. Heaven awaits you. And to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. One minute here, the next split nanosecond in glory. Whew, it doesn't get any better than that. But oh, let it be a testimony, let it be a witness. Trust in the God. You see, uh, God wants to shape you and I into what he wants us to be for him and for his glory. That's what the psalmist would write later. What, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? Oh, the creator. Oh, you see, not only this, the, the, the reverence of the Lord is the presence of God, the perspective of the Lord, but prayer to the Lord. In verse seven, he prays. To the Lord. Oh, you look at the prayer David prays in verse 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusteth in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song I will praise him. Look at the prayer. Oh, that's in verse 28. That sounded pretty good anyway, didn't it? Amen. Chapter 27. Hear, O Lord, when I cry, that's my prayer, with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. Oh, you see, we'll come to verse eight here in just a second. So there's prayer. That's why our parable this morning, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not faint. Should have been here for Sunday school. It's a parable, fantastic parable. Amen. The fourth step, we're almost done. That's a real quickly one here. In verse eight, the step of obedience. Look at verse 8 with me. The step of obedience. When thou sayest. Now David's saying, Lord, when you say something, 
Seek ye my face. This is what David's saying. When the Lord says, seek my face, David said what? My heart saith unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. That's 100% obedience. See, the Bible says obedience is greater than sacrifice. God's looking for obedience. See, during a crisis, now look with me here quickly. During a crisis, we tend to react with our own reasoning. How many agree with that? Because we do. Rather than reflect on what God wants to do in us. See, God wants complete obedience, not careful disobedience. See, a lot of people are careful to be disobedient. God doesn't want your careful disobedience. He wants your obedience. That's like the little boy that was running in the backyard. He's making a beeline for the back door kitchen. And the mother yells out the window, Johnny, stop, stop. Your dad just painted those steps. It's brand new wet paint. Stop. And the little boy just kept going. He said, he said Mom, but I'll be careful. She hollered out again as he got closer. Johnny, stop. He just painted that. He, and you're going to get your feet wet and tracking. Mom, I'll be very careful. So just about the time he reaches it, she yells out again in desperation, Johnny, Johnny, stop. He stops and looks at her. I'm not concerned about how careful you're going to be. I want to know how obedient you're going to be. See, he was going to be so careful, CJ. Wasn't going to be obedient to his mother to stop, but I'll be careful not to step in the, step in the paint. Now, you know how hard that's going to be for a boy that's running full speed up the stairs? We do the same thing in our lives. Well, God, I'll be careful in my disobedience. I got this. But God doesn't want us to be careful. Disobedience. He wants obedience. Lastly, we're finished. Here's the last one for this step, the fifth step and final, the step of patience. The step of patience. Waiting on the Lord, listen to me, is never wasted time. <laughs> Waiting on the Lord is never wasted time. That's what he said to wait. God has your best interest in heart. How many of you agree with that? You will miss his desires for you if you rush through the crisis. You're going to miss what God has for you if you rush through it. You see, you get in such a big hurry, you're like the little boy. And you run down here, and you're supposed to hang a left-hand curve right here. If you're coming down the aisle this way, you're going to turn left. And yet, because you're going so fast and hurt, you go straight on by. And the blessing was right there. You see, the blessing is just around the corner. But you missed it because you're in such a big hurry. You don't want to wait on the Lord. We got to wait on the Lord. Isaiah said it this way, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. How many of y'all know that song? The song, we learned that song in Isaiah. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to wait. How many remember that song? It's a beautiful song. We ought to sing it a little more often. You got to do some waiting. Wait on the Lord. Patience, endurance. You see, here's the problems. Here's your choices. You can focus on the crisis and despair. You can focus on the crisis this morning and despair, or you can do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says. You can cast all your care on him, for he careth for you. That's the choice, Susan. You have a choice. You can focus on the crisis. And we don't minimize that in anyone's life. And you can stay despair by it. Or you can cast all your care on Him. 
for he careth for you. That's why we sing burdens are lifted at Calvary. What happens is many of you, go for a wide shot here, Darlene. I'm going to get wide, not body-wise. We have a wheelbarrow church with all of our worries and frustrations and crisis and everything, our burdens. We hear a message like this. So we bring them down to the altar. And we get down and we say, Lord, I'm casting all my cares on you. And we're down praying. Now the wheelbarrow's still sitting here with all the cares. Then we get up, rather than walking back to our seats, casting our care, having confidence and trust in the Lord, we go back and we pick the wheelbarrow up and we go right back with it. And you haven't cast anything. You can focus on your crisis this morning, your situation, your circumstance, and get very despaired, become very anxious, worried, fearful, frightful, and all of that. Or you can come to Calvary today, and you can unload it. Why carry it when there's somebody who wants to carry it for you? Is the Lord Jesus Christ. Second one, you can trust in the Lord and wait on Him. Amen? Amen? What does Proverbs 3, 5 tell us? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. And in all thy ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. But in order for him to direct your path, you have got to trust in the Lord. And lean not unto your own understanding. But in all of your ways acknowledge him. And he'll direct your path. See, the choice is yours. You can focus on the crisis and get despaired, or you can trust in the Lord and wait on Him. Amen? Waiting involves courage. Courage is another word for faith, believe it or not. Waiting is going to require faith on your part. It's going to require courage. Write it down and read it later. I don't have time. Joshua chapter 1, verses 6, 7, and 9. Joshua chapter 1, verses 6, 7, and 9, where the Lord tells Joshua, Moses has died. My servant is dead. Now you're taking over. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, do I get a choice in this matter? I can see Joshua, you know what I mean? Right? I mean, do I get a choice in this, Lord? Nope, no choice. Moses, my servant is dead. You're taking over. That's like yesterday. Somebody knocked on my door and they said, we're here to do a, a, a census. I said, well, no, ma'am, I'm not interested. Saying, no, this is a health census about drugs and, and, and alcohol and, and, and all of this stuff. And I said, yes, ma'am, that's underwater. Did you not get this letter? And I said, well, I, truthfully and honestly, I have no idea. Don't know if I did or not. When I see mail that's not directly addressed to me and I don't know who it is, it goes in the circular file. She goes, well, you've you, you, you got to take this census, she said, because the satellite flew over and took the picture of your house, and you're number 262 out of the chosen ones. And I said, well, ma'am, I guess what? I didn't ask to be chosen. I didn't ask the satellite to fly around. I didn't ask for this, and so I'm not taking the survey. Do we have, are we clear? I said, I have my rights as an American. I have my constitutional rights, and you have violated my constitutional rights by flying a satellite over and taking a picture of my house without my permission. She got mad, stormed out to her car, <laughs> started taking pictures. My bodyguard ran out. Hey, you can't do that. See, I stayed in the house. I'm the smart one. See, she had courage. I stayed in the house with Caleb. I'm holding him. Back boy, hold back boy. Not yet, not yet. I had the door open. He was right behind me. I had my hand down there. Stay right here. He's got the eye on her. He's a quiet one. He's a stealth dog. You don't know where he's at, when he's at, and when he's there. You can look all around, think he's over here, the next thing you know, he's standing right beside you looking at you. You don't even hear him breathing. You don't even hear him moving. He's stealth. Well, when he wants to go into action, he goes into action. Those are the ones I'm afraid of that don't make no noise and don't bark. The ones that bark and make all kinds of noise, I'm not worried about them. It's the quiet ones. So she's out there taking pictures. Then she sends this guy down the street. He's taking pictures. Well, my bodyguard went after him too. Amen. Waiting involves courage. You've got to have some courage in the crisis to wait on the Lord, to wait for his counsel, 
to wait for his direction, you see. Or you can go the other route. But David said, hey, here's what you need to do. Here's what I'm doing. Now, David's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, right? Because every word in here is God-breathed, the inspired word of God. And David says, here's my crisis that I'm going through. Man, I'm in the middle of a war. Saul's trying to kill me. My son's leading a revolt against the kingdom against me. The Philistines are after me. I killed their giant. They're really after me now. I mean, you know, and on and on. And I've committed sin and, and, and everything. And I wonder if God will even hear me when I call on him and all this. And so, I mean, this guy's in a crisis. And he tells us, here's what you need to do. Because he says, here's what I'm going to do. What am I going to do? David says, I'm going to be vigilant. I'm going to be alert. I'm going to be watchful. I'm going to be aware of the danger around me. He said, then, then what am I going to do? He said, I'm going to have confidence in my God that he's going to deliver me. Then I'm going to have a reverence for him. I'm going to the house of God, and we're going to do some things. And I'm going to have this great reverence for the Lord. Then I'm going to have this wonderful perspectiveness of the Lord, you see, after all this bad news and good news stuff. And I'm going to come to prayer. Then I'm going to do this step of obedience and complete obedience, and then I'm going to wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. God will strengthen your heart as you wait on him. Because see, your heart's going to go weary. It's going to get tired. Yeah. Now, if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, we ask you to be saved today. Come to the Lord. Trust Him. Those that are watching, if you're still with us, I know we're late, but we'll do our best to get it out to you. Come to Christ today. Invite Him to come into your heart and life to be your Lord and Savior. You say, well, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Let me tell you what the Bible says for you to do. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord in heaven, and you will believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's what the Bible says. So if you'll do that right now, wherever you're at, who's ever watching, mean it from your heart. Let it come from your heart. God will hear it, and God will save you and forgive you of your sins and cleanse you and give you a new life in Christ a new home in heaven, a name written down in glory. All of that by coming to Christ. If you've never done that, we ask you to do it right now. Just pray that prayer. Pray however you have to. God, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. That's what the thief on the cross played. And he was saved because Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. There was another man praying at the wall and he was bowing his head and he was beating on his chest and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus told that publican that was praying, he said, I tell you, that man went home justified. He went home saved. Praise God. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. So bless you as we leave and go off the air now. God bless you. Thanks for watching and tuning in with us. We love you. Jesus loves you. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon him and may all of God's grace and favor be upon you in Jesus name amen and amen God bless you